Good morning. Uh, I presume you can see my screen. Uh, I'm uh, Oliver Tully. I uh, work in uh, fisheries in the Marine Institute. And I'm going to talk to you today about just uh, some programs and uh, projects we're engaged in in the monitoring of marine uh, benthic habitats and development of methods for, for the same. So I work with um, uh, in fisheries, but also fisheries environment interactions, especially within the Natura 2000 uh, Marine Protected Area Network. And in, the, in these projects, we work closely with the Inframar team, with the Emer O'Keefe especially, and with our contractors in Merck, uh, that's Louis Scali and, and Nick Pfeiffer, and our funding comes from the EMFF uh, Marine uh, Biodiversity Scheme. So uh, our objective is to develop methods for, for monitoring of uh, marine seafloor communities, benthic communities, and the objective and basis of using the Inframar data would be that variables that are derived from the Inframar bathymetry can be used to characterize seabed terrain. And importantly, that offers a valuable tool for delineating regions that are likely to support different uh, biological, biological communities on the seafloor. There's a question mark over that and how we might detect that relationship uh, if it exists. But if it's true, then it provides a basis for stratification uh, of biological sampling programs. And really importantly, it provides the basis for habitat modeling. In other words, extending, um, extending the, the information on distribution and, and structure of seafloor communities based on the fact that the Inframar data provides 100% ground cover. And you can do that then if, if, there, if, if the terrain data and the biological data are, are well correlated. And so that's what that's really what uh, what we're about. Um, why would we do that? Well, uh, there's an onerous list of requirements, really, um, that the Marine Institute or other agencies are required to report under uh, under various articles of various directives. Uh, the National Parks and Wildlife Service need to report under Article 17 on the status of uh, status and change. And there really is a big data deficiency in that respect in the in the reporting of the status of reef habitat in particular, and that's an annex one habitat in the in the directive. The institute itself, and this is work we do in fisheries, is responsible for Article Six assessments of the effects of fisheries and aquaculture, and the you know that's an onerous requirement. The bar is set high there. We have to prove negative uh, the absence of significant effects. So how do you do that in the absence of uh, good information on biological communities on the seafloor? Same true with uh, the MSFD, the assessment of GES, good environmental status in, in that directive. Um, again, uh, the Marine Institute reports uh, that and advises the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government on, on GES. The Institute also uh, monitors transitional waters and for the framework direct, water framework directive. And I guess two, two uh, newer requirements uh, and, certain, and the last one, the Marine Protected Area Network is on, is on the horizon. Irish government policy now is to expand the uh, the area of the network to thirty percent of the of the Irish territory. You know that's that the, the optimum design of that really uh, needs better information on, distrib on distribution and status of uh, underlying habitats. Okay, so we have two projects uh, operating uh, really in one since 2017-18, one in, in, on the southwest coast to look at the extent of reef habitat and how it supports the distribution of, of crayfish, uh, spiny lobster habitat, uh, the ca carrying capacity of that, of that habitat, uh, and the potential for restoration, given that these, these populations are somewhat depleted because of the effects of historic fishing. Also, this is a, an Article 6 assessment, perhaps, of the effect of, fishing, of removal of crayfish, which is a, a keystone species, let's say, on reef habitat, what the effect of removal of that would be or is on, on reef, uh, reef communities. And to know that, of course, we have to know the structure of uh, the communities in the first place. And in addition to the, the terrain data uh, derived from, from Inframar and the biological sampling uh, data that we get from underwater uh, methods provided by Merck, we also have fishery data, which we're gradually building up. So we're able to overlay the fishery data uh, on top of the terrain data, maybe at different resolutions, but nevertheless, we're able to interpolate and, and demonstrate small scale kind of spatial variability in abundance of various species which are living close to or on or on reef. That's an example of the what uh, on the bottom there what the what crayfish habitat might look like underwater. Uh, you know, rocky platform with steep gullies and and, and ledges. Uh, 
which provide habitat for for uh, for for crayfish. So our approach uh, has been to to study in detail uh, half a dozen sites there, um, from Galway inside the Aran Islands down to the west coast, west of Clare and the, and, and North Kerry, and derived various terrain derivatives from uh, from the bathymetry data, including you know the slope, rugosity, aspect. Uh, variability, um, and then to explore the relationships between that terrain data and the uh, uh, and the biological and the biological data, acquiring biological data on georeferenced uh, video transects, uh, stills, etc. And there's an example there on the bottom, which where we can, in fact, place a, a, a video on an area of low slope versus a, a, a video transect on on high slope. So we're already beginning to uh, stratify our sampling uh, according to the underlying uh, underlying terrain. But there's a question mark, you know, does, does terrain matter? Um, so does it matter whether this, uh, these photographs, there are obviously different communities there, but does it matter, does the terrain, the, the, the fact that it's a horizontal platform as opposed to a vertical platform, uh, as opposed to a rocky, uh, a boulder outcrop, uh, is, is that important? And there's a very simple analogy, I think, uh, where to look at terrain that you can actually see. Uh, if you if you walk in the burn, for instance, uh, you, you know, does terrain matter to the floral communities that you see on the burn? Yes, of course it does. There's no flora on horizontal limestone uh, pavement, but in the gullies and crevices uh, between those pavement, slabs of pavement, there's a rich flora. So the same uh, question applies underwater here. And actually a lot of this terrain looks like the burn underwater, in fact, when you see the, uh, the bathymetry data. Um, so terrain matters in, in some respect, but we're not sure yet how it influences the structure and function of marine brinthic communities. Also, it, it's more than simply terrain because, uh, you know, biological processes also influence communities. Grazers such as sea urchin, uh, may dominate, uh, may, may influence really strongly the structure of benthic communities uh, and overwhelm any effect that terrain might have or may be detectable uh, due to, you know, in, in that respect. And also the overlying water column is important. So ocean, oceanographic data, uh, shear bed current strength on top of the terrain data and accounting for biology is all important. And obviously it's a very uh, difficult problem to, um, to, tease, to tease apart. This is kind of typical crayfish, uh, crayfish habitat, in, uh, as I was saying, but it also might, might vary according to different life stages of the animal. So high rugosity may be very important in the early life history stages, which are cryptic and require very small hiding spaces uh, for uh, protection from predation, as opposed to uh, the terrain uh, later on when the animal is bigger. So we begin to explore these relationships between, in this case, uh, species richness and rugosity, for instance, at, uh, at, at the six sites. And you see, we, we do find some correlations, but they're quite weak, probably meaning that we have a sampling problem or that we're not looking at the key uh, terrain variable or that we're not describing the community appropriately in the, in the right way. But what are the key functional variables? Uh, we know we have a big multivariate problem here in trying to discern these, these, these relationships. Um, or are we simply looking at communities that are not that spatially structured in the first place? But in any case, there's an implication for monitoring. Uh, we have to design monitoring programs that we have confidence in. And we have, to, we have therefore to explore uh, whether uh, these variables are important, which ones to use, and what are other ones uh, we, we need to consider. But even in, the, in these cases where we find low correlations, uh, we can at least begin to classify, uh, using the terrain data, areas which are likely to support high diversity and low diversity. And this is a map uh, around the Iron Islands, Inchmore, showing areas of high and low species richness modeled using maximum likelihood classification based on the data we have. Uh, so immediately you would say that uh, there's a higher potential, there's a higher potential for high, high diversity on the west uh, west side compared to the east side uh, of, of the islands. And that in itself is informative, even in the context of uh, future MPA design. Um, the second project we've just started, and it, it relates uh, closely to, I suppose, what Fabio was uh, talking about here uh, just, just a while ago, 
and we must talk to uh, to more about the that that program because we've um, we've also now ex extended the, the the project just in Kilkeran Bay into intertidal inter, inter, intertidal monitoring. So now we're using uh, drone imagery uh, of the intertidal zone in the same way that we use terrain data uh, from Inframar in the in the subtitle and using various uh, classification uh, methods uh, to identify uh, the, the main biological communities, seaweed cover, et cetera, on the intertidal zone as a, as a means of stratifying what we then do on the ground uh, by walking through these areas uh, to, to look at um, uh, biodiversity and structure and function of communities in, in more detail. And then when we go underwater, of course, we we can't use that anymore. So we, we take the then the the bathymetry data, derive the terrain data, and use that to inform, uh, inform biological sampling. So we now have, through Merck, uh, high capacity to have high precision georeferenced underwater video data that we can home in on very fine resolution, fine scale terrain uh, in order to explore those relationships uh, further. So in summary, our projects are evaluating these relationships between physical terrain uh, uh, derived from bathymetry and biological communities in reef, both in the intertidal and subtidal. Um, we have to identify metrics and indicators of change from that program. We don't know yet. We're still exploring those relationships, really. But whatever uh, comes out uh, at, at the end here, we need methods that are scalable to a national program. We do need a, a, a national scale program for monitoring of change and really input into other policy initiatives, such as uh, the expansion of the MPA uh, Marine Protected Area Network. And that monitoring program needs to be, we need to have confidence in it. Uh, it's not an ad hoc sampling program. It's not an ad hoc allocation of sampling efforts. Uh, it needs to be stru structured based on the underlying, based on important underlying, uh, underlying uh, data on, on the physical, biological, and, um, and oceanographic, um, oceanographic environment. Okay, thank you for listening.